welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in this episode I'm very honored to have the one and only Dr. Mike Israel. In this episode of the podcast we're going to be discussing how to design a nutrition plan when trying to maximize muscle growth. So Mike is going to cover all the fundamentals from calories to protein to carbohydrates, fat, meal timing, frequencies and how to manipulate the hedonic power of food and to make our food more palatable um, when we're in a massing phase to help us ensure that we can meet our caloric needs uh, to continue to make gains and support our recovery and those hypertrophic adaptations that we are getting from our training stimulus. So without further ado, I present you Dr. Mike Isretel. Cool. Let's do it. All right, guys. Welcome back to the JPS podcast, and we have Dr. Mike Isretel. What's up, Doc? Not much, man. Good to see you. Good to talk to you. I'm with my classic camera angle of make myself look like I have eight chins, and shit's, shit's good. That's awesome, man. We're, uh, I'm sure the listeners and the people watching on YouTube will appreciate the uh, the jumper matching your uh, your wall there. You blend Great. In. Thanks. I'm trying to stay stealthy. It's like, yeah, you're like a chameleon. Mm-hmm. And today, guys, we're going to talk to Mike about nutrition for muscle growth and how we can um, optimize our, our diets to make the most of our training and ensure we're capitalizing on what we're doing in the gym. And before we start, uh, Mike, what are you working on at the moment? I guess that's one thing that you guys at RP are always doing is you've got a lot of things uh, ticking over. Uh, is there anything that you're currently working on? Boy, oh boy, is that a loaded question. So, we just did a very, very when is this coming out? Probably next week, man. <laughs> Sounds good. We just did a very low scope release of the RP diet app. Well, wow. yeah, that's yeah. been in the works for too long. And uh, what we're doing now is not posting any links to it. We're not talking about it on social media. You know, people will see this, they can look at it, but, um, we want to keep the user base intentionally small for now because we're doing bug fixing and doing some important feature updates. And after a few months, we're going to do them a little bit more of a blast on social media. And then we're going to install some more features, which are all planned. And then we're going to do a bigger blast and so on and so forth. And the app is already super, super cool. Um, and it's going to be something that's very, very powerful and very special. Um, so that's what I've been working on for a long time and what I'm still working on as far as increasing its uh, power. And uh, other stuff we're working on is we're finishing the RP Diet Book 2.0, mm-hmm. which should be out in December, uh, early December. And that's big. We're also working with, uh, uh, I suppose I can probably announce this now, um, uh, although it's, it's, it's the, most of the project's done, so it's not a problem to announce, I don't think. Uh, Spen- Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, you know who that is? Mm-hmm. Fucking cunt, any. So uh, he is uh, a nice man, and uh, him and I uh, have cooperated at RP to make something called the weight loss templates. Um, and they're basically like, like, so we have this app and it's super powerful, and we have the um, the slightly older diet templates, and they're super mm-hmm. cool. Uh, but they're a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say complicated, they're a little bit involved. You know, like if you have counted macros before and you really give a shit about your training, you're going to love the fucking app. And you're, I'm sure you've used the templates before and they're great. But they're like, you know, you have to know like what time of the day you're training and shit like that. Like meal one, meal two, there's six meals, blah, blah, blah. The weight loss templates are like uh, the diet your mom and dad can follow. Like it's the most simplified version to see basic nutrition and to lose weight. It guides you through a structure of like for a while eat this then eat a little less then eat a little less then it goes down to where it has pictures of food and if if there's like a reference scale of how big the pictures are and if you just make a plate that looks like that you'll lose weight (laughs) and it's like three meals a day it's no reference to training at all it's just for regular Mm -hmm. folks that just want to lose some weight and eat healthy they're tired of fad diet bullshit so 
we're finishing those up so those are going to be out sometime in the next several months so a lot of really good stuff i've actually begun this is very much more relevant to your audience i have almost finished the detailed outline of the hypertrophy book scientific principles of hypertrophy training uh the detailed outline by itself is over 10 pages long wow. so this book's going to be a fucking monster and there's <laughs> The, the research on hypertrophy so far, is, especially this last year, has been so productive that we're finally getting a consilience on these topics and getting some clarity to where a book makes sense. People were asking me after we wrote Scientific Principles of Strength Training uh, four, four years ago or whatever, people were asking me, like, when's hypertrophy book coming out? And I'm like, not for multiple years. And they were like, what the hell is wrong with you? Why not? And I was like, hey, we literally just don't know enough. Like at that point, training frequency just hadn't been elucidated at all. Like it just, we just didn't know. You know, uh, training volumes, like the volume landmarks for hypertrophy were sort of a guess. Now they're not nearly as much. So a lot of that really, really good stuff. And, and the cool thing is, I guess, to segue into the discussion of muscle growth, fresh off of, uh, of finishing the RP Diet Book 2.0, it's an editing now, and muscle gain nutrition is a real big part of that book. Awesome, man. That's uh, very exciting to hear, and I'm, I have no doubt that uh, yeah, all of those projects will be a booming success. I'm very interested to see what you guys have put together with the app, that'll be very cool. And I think that just gives you another platform to, to help people. Sure, thanks. You know, if you, a little birdie told me that if you um, search RP Diet on the App Store on iPhone, uh, you can find the app and there's a free trial, all I'm saying. Um, so it's actually a free two-week trial uh, and then you have to pay us money. Um, and then... nine ninety nine. That That's the month. deal. It's nine ninety nine ninety nine a month, oh, so it's sorry. actually one thousand um, uh, dollars. We charge in rupees. <laughs> no, um, the app is fifteen dollars a month for monthly subscription. Mm -hmm. Ten dollars a month, or tw ten, ten, twelve dollars a month if you do the year. Mm -hmm. But we will have occasional promotional sales where it'll be much cheaper than that. So awesome. then you'll buy in bulk. But uh, yeah, it's super cool. Uh, just uh, if, if anyone's confused about what the app is, go play with it. But it uh, takes all of your information. It writes you a diet. It lets you pick the foods. It auto-calculates all the uh, amounts of food for you. And it, it auto-updates the diet every week as you weigh in to give you a new version that keeps you losing weight, gaining weight, or maintaining. So it's a diet coach in your pocket. Really wow. pretty interesting shit. Yeah, it kind of makes the templates look a little bit meh. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're still super the friendly. To, yeah, fuck the, that's the app's, like, the app's actually called Fuck the Templates. If Nick Shaw ever hears you say that, he's going to cut your fucking balls off. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, Sorry, no, the, the templates are still, yeah, like this for the next three months, the templates are probably just at least as good as the app because, you know, we got to get the bugs out, get all the fine tuning done after two or three months from now. Um, the app will begin to be superior to the templates. Clearly three to six months from now, the app is going to make the templates look like, why did we ever make these? So, um, really cool, cool stuff on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. And yeah, I guess today let's talk about nutrition for muscle growth uh, and, you know, people looking to get uh, swole. So in terms of calorie intake, um, do you want to just outline how somebody should look to set up their calorie intake when they're wanting to build muscle and some of the factors that should influence uh, the size of the surplus um, if they are to have a surplus at all? Because, you know, many times beginners... Uh, it can build some muscle at maintenance calories, potentially a small surplus, whereas sometimes, you know, the more advanced athletes might need to uh, really ensure that they're putting all their eggs into the surplus basket. So do you just want to outline some basic recommendations for calorie intake when people are looking to get jacked, Mike? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think I suppose I'll talk in like what's most effective. And then if people want to do like sort of slightly less effective things like not gain weight, they can. Um, gaining weight is always going to result in more muscle gain than not gaining weight. You know, mm -hmm. beginners can also gain muscle while losing weight, but we don't really advocate that as a first step <laughs> in a hypertrophy plan. Mm -hmm. So with muscle growth, you definitely want a caloric surplus. How big that surplus is, I think, is anywhere between 0.25% and 0.5% of body weight gained per week. So if you're 100 kilos... Uh, that's going to be something like between a quarter a kilo and a half kilo per week. In other words, that's something like between, what is it, a uh, quarter, one to two kilos a month, right? One to two kilos a month, 
doesn't sound like a crazy amount, but, you know, two kilos a month for three months and you're up six kilos. That's quite a bit. Right. Um, and you know, potentially, you know, if you go over like, you know, six kilos in three months, you're just getting really fat for no reason, not any good reason. If you go under, man, it's just really hard to, you know, can you imagine telling someone like, yeah, I gained a kilo in the last three months. And they're like, how do you know you gained a kilo? Like you just had some Chinese food and you gained three kilos. Cause you know, like, right. So it's the tracking becomes a problem. And also you could be gaining faster. One interesting thing about gaining is because fat loss is so much faster and relatively easier than muscle gain, and because in relatively well-trained individuals especially, it's not hard to keep muscle during a fat loss phase that's not extreme, and it's not hard to gain muscle back really quickly even if you lose a little bit, that there it sort of benefits um, a structure that means you gain a little bit more aggressively than you could and then cut the fat off and then start gaining again versus just really being averse to any kind of fat gains. And, and that's it's a, it, a very interesting thing. Ugh, sorry, but I changed position. Uh, it's a very interesting thing that that's tends to happen said. with folks. <laughs> so she's never said, I've never been with a woman. So, um, or a man, nobody likes me at all. It's the body odor that's the real problem. Um, Forever messy. So, exactly, and never showering. So I don't want to wash the gains away. Ooh, that's a really good idea. You know, we should be warning people about washing away gains because, you know, in fact, to, to help them keep their gains. Yeah. Like yeah, game like people 100. Or right. Like, but you don't, but, but you don't use it because it'll wash the gains away or yeah. A shampoo no, you wipe it on doesn't instead of wash having, it. yeah, yeah. Let's do it. It's like step one, wipe on shampoo. And you're like, is there a step about washing it off? Like, no, you idiot. No. It keeps your gains on. You yeah. want to wear it like a fucking astronaut suit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so a lot of people have this idea they want to gain muscle and they're like, okay, but I don't want to get fat for sure. And they'll just go the slowest possible route. The most obvious downside is they could just be gaining muscle needlessly slow and just sort of get to where they're going slower than needed. I can appreciate the lifetime fitness crowd. That's like, I don't care how slow the muscle gain is. I'm in this for the long haul. Like, that's totally cool. Um, but then, you know, there's a bunch of intermediary steps, but the one more relevant step that I can think of that counters that argument is the following. Um, imagine you have a personal training client. I imagine that a variety of your listeners to this podcast are personal trainers and they come to you and they say, Hey, I want to put on muscle. Are you really going to design them a plan that is needlessly conservative so that they are disappointed sort of by design with their rates of muscle gain? I mean, no, I sure hope not. Right? Like that's a bad deal. So you want to shoot for a rate of gains that is not excessively fat, uh, enhancing but one that which you know is pretty decent and then you'll just do a fat loss phase at the end so i think that that 0.5 um percent per week uh applies very well to that if you if you really don't want to add much fat you can go closer to the 0.25 percent and so anything in between is just fine um now the next question is how do you determine those values well there's a little bit of a complex formula to try to figure that out based on your body weight right because the percentages means it's going to be different calories and because they're based on body weight it's going to be different calorie amounts but roughly speaking you the first thing you have to do is establish your maintenance intake and by that i mean find out what it even is some people will ask me how much how many calories should i be eating to gain weight and I go, how many calories do you eat to maintain weight? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, how the fuck are you? How, how the hell are you supposed to know what you do to gain weight, right? It's like, how do I make my car go faster? Well, how fast does it currently go? I don't know. Well, well it's kind of you know important. If your car already goes 800 kilometers an hour, baseline. then yeah, any, any faster is going to kill you, right? So, or we need to install a jet engine to go faster than that, right? So, uh, the baseline is really actually simple to get. You start tracking your food over two or three weeks. You regularly maintain your check your body weight. You get it to a point where you eat a little less, a little more, and get it into within a pretty narrow range of roughly 100 kilos or so, I guess, in a, is a good example. And, you know, 90, 99, 98, 101, 102, so it's always around there. Then you basically figured out your maintenance intake, right? And then add to that anywhere between 250 and 500 calories, or maybe like 150 to 500 calories, depending on how large of an individual you are. Uh, and then, you know, from there, you can gain weight. Here's the huge caveat. You you can add the calories and sort of assume that you're gaining weight, but you have to confirm it with the scale. So you have to look at averages. You have to make sure that you are actually gaining weight by body weight averages. And you should take your weight two to four times a week, maybe even up to seven. And if your weight is trending up, 
then at, at the appropriate rate, then you're doing a good job. But if your weight is not trending up, it doesn't matter how many calories it says you're eating. You have to eat more. And if it's trending up too fast, you have to eat less. It kills me. How many people say, well, I'm eating 3,000 calories. You're not gaining weight. And they look at you. Like, the fuck are you looking at? Eat more. And they're like, really? But it's 3,000 calories. Like, I'm not sure what you think that number means. That's some kind of religious significance to you. Like if there's a fucking like 3,000 and you fucking the Illuminati eye and the fucking pyramid line up and you can fucking see the star of death. And the first like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, eat more. And they're like, oh, you really? Like, yeah, <laughs> you're not gaining weight. And I'm like, okay. So a lot of it is feedback related. Awesome. That's uh, yeah, very comprehensive. And I think... As you mentioned, the most important thing is to, to find that baseline and not uh, become overly reliant on calculators and, and numbers or looking to what other people do to gain weight. It, it's, it has to be individualized uh, because everyone's going to have different maintenance requirements. And moving oh, totally. on. Totally. I can't. Sorry, real quick, just a yeah. quick rant. I can't tell you how many people, and I don't even get a lot of these questions, but like I, you pro bodybuilders, get them all the time. Uh, and I've had my fair share. How many calories do you eat per day? Like, there's not a question that makes me as mad as that that they can reliably tell you exists. Like, uh, how many calories do you eat per day? I literally got to a point where, like, I think I was in, like, I was cutting, so I was a little irritable. And people would ask me that. And I would literally respond, like, a little bit rudely and out of character for me. I would respond with, why? And they're like, well, I just want to know. I'm like, no, you don't just want to know. There's a purpose for your question. What is the purpose? And they're like, well, I just want to see what it takes for a guy your weight to gain weight. And I'm like, why? How much do you weigh? They're like 70 kilos. I'm like, I weigh 110. They're like, yeah. So how many calories do you eat? I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Ask me, how many calories should I eat to gain weight? Because that's really what you give a shit about. And I'll send you I'll send you some baseline formulas. I'll send you some basic tables. And I'll tell you how to make sure you're gaining by monitoring your weight. That's the answer you really want to know. My 5,000 or 4,500 what is that? Just if you're asking just for entertainment, could be like, oh shit, that's a lot. Like that's great. There was um there was a guy once who did a review about uh, Arnold Classic um, uh, parts of the contest and the expo, and uh, he said uh, like well, about the um, there was like a meet meet the athletes thing where it's like Jay Cutler seminar. And uh, Jay Cutler had been winning the Arnold like every year at that point, and he's like, yeah, you go to the seminar, some cool stuff. The downside is that like. You get to hear the same kid ask how many chicken breasts Jay Cutler eats per day. <laughs> and it's just like, like you know, there's tons, there's tons of guys there in the audience that want to ask him relevant questions. Like, how many chicken breasts do you eat per day? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? How is that relevant to anything? He could say 12. He could say 80. It would all be the same to you. Just sit there mouth agape. So you're totally right about, like, it's individual. Like, it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. Are you gaining weight? If the answer is no, you got to fix your shit. Awesome. And that stems into, I guess, the next discussion uh, surrounding how we break down those calories because obviously uh, the macronutrients play a unique role in uh, providing our calories. Uh, so let's first talk about protein. So total protein intake is probably the most important uh, you know, variable when it comes to discussing the macronutrients. Um, but as we increase calories, uh, typically that increase in calories is going to come from carbohydrates and higher carbohydrates uh, are typically going to have trace protein, so we're not going to get uh, you know the amino acid profile that we would if our you know calories were all coming from chicken breast, uh, because we're getting more protein from you know grains and things like that, uh, contributing to our total protein. So, how do you navigate that, and what are some recommendations uh, that you give in terms of total protein intake or, uh, for massing? Totally. So total protein intake should be clustered roughly around a uh, fuck Australia, um, uh, two grams per one point eight grams per kilo. That sounds terrible to say. So two grams per kilo is just fine. Right? So two grams per kilo, and then you can do some modulation there f from there on. In. If you're super hungry and you're on a mass phase, which can happen like after a diet a post show or people who have gained a lot of weight in the past and don't want to return there, even their masses, they can be super hungry. They can eat more protein to stifle hunger a little bit. Totally fine. Then you have folks that do um, really have trouble eating mm -hmm. and protein is so filling and so anti-hunger that you just don't want to eat too much of it. Those folks can go as low as 1.8 and even as low as 1.6 grams per kilo, no problem. Uh, particularly because all the ancillary proteins are going to be super crazy, right? And how you count your protein matters. 
uh, in the age of my fitness pal, where you can get 300 grams of protein from bread, mm-hmm. uh, and you'll realize that that's you have to slash that by a quarter because the gluten is barely digestible and barely assimilable. So, uh, you know, I would when I count protein, I count a little bit out of the grains, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but I count mostly out of uh, whole, complete protein sources, mm-hmm. meats, milks, etc., powders. So I think counted in that way, you know, you're looking at 1.6 to one uh, to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. Higher if you need anti-hunger, lower if you need to stuff yourself with a lot of food. And then you go from there. What I will say is this. As your surplus increases, the uh, amount of anti-catabolic need for your protein goes down because there's always flooded with carbohydrates. So it turns out you can actually gain muscle on lower protein intakes than you can cut with only because the cutting needs the anti-catabolic effect of protein, where the muscle gain does not. So I think as a low as 1.4 grams per kilo of counted complete sources is totally cool. And then you'll get so much other shit from grains, etc. that, oops, hold on a sec. Am I back? Mm-hmm. Could you hear me the entire yeah, time? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you get you know, so much uh, protein from the ancillary sources that even at 1.4 of counted complete proteins, you're totally cool. Um, That's just basically the outline on protein intake. And I think a a big myth that we should just definitely pay lip service to is the idea that, you know, I'm I'm gaining weight, I got to eat more protein. Past about a gram of protein per pound of body weight or two grams per kilo or so, you just don't see an improvement in muscle gain with incrementally high protein. I wish it was the case. It would make things so linear and so simple. You want to get bigger, eat more protein. I remember discussing this with um, my training partner uh, and friend, Charlie, who is uh, like 370 kilo squatter, and uh, my buddy, Marcos Rodriguez, who's on the Sports Scientist podcast mm-hmm. and has been a trainer in New York for a long time. And they both recounted that at various points in their <laughs> adolescent lifting careers, they had eaten uh, in excess – uh, both had tried diets in which they ate double their body weight in pounds in protein per day, which is like 3.7 kilos per, in grams protein per day. So we're talking about for these guys, it was 450 mm-hmm. grams of protein per day. Um, and I was like, how was it? And I think, I think it was a Marcos maybe that, that tried three times his body weight before. Um, yeah. So like 500 grams of protein per day, that sort of thing. And I was like, how was it? It was, like, it was fucking terrible. He was like, I would have meals with four chicken breasts. That was the meal. Um, and then three hours later, I would have that again. Like, can you imagine that 100-gram protein wow. meal? Um, and and, and he, I was like, so how was the gains? And he was like, this is the fucking same as they always were. And I had probably less because I got less pumped because I had to cut so many carbs to make room for the protein. You know. So it's one of those things where people say, like, oh, I'm fucking gaining weight. I got to fucking smash protein. The thing is those people are also like, it's fucking ridiculous. Because here's the deal. They'll be like – I'm fucking gaining muscle. I got to eat more protein. They're like, okay, sweet. And they're like, I'm fucking dieting. I got to eat more protein to save my gains. They're like, okay, is there a recursive formula in which you don't eat more protein? They're like, no. Like, do you just always, like, you end a diet, you eat more protein. You start a diet, you eat more protein. Pretty soon, these people are eating, like, earth sized chunks of protein. It just doesn't go, doesn't go anywhere. It's just not the case. Past about, uh, you know, gram or two grams per kilo, there's just not much there unless it's for hunger modulation and or unless you're a vegan vegetarian. In which case, there's an argument for a man, 2.5 or something like that. Fantastic. And I think it always baffles me how frequently I hear people over-relying on diet to build muscle. And they think that, you know, if they get the calories right and their protein intake right, they're just going to build muscle. Uh, Nutrition and protein intake will augment the muscle you know, building process, uh, but training is is a catalyst, you know, for initiating that process. And I think, yeah, beyond a certain point, you're definitely right, Mike. You know, uh, more protein isn't going to do anything else, especially if your training's not there in the first place. Well, training is hard and eating is fun, so I tend to disagree with you. I don't want to train hard, so I'm just <laughs> going to eat more and then gain more muscle like that. I wish, and. That's that's a good segue for protein dosing per meal. So once we've got our protein uh, intake set up, uh, you know around that two gram uh, per kg mark, 
you know, how should people spread that meal? I'm sure that many folk would have heard of, uh, you know, the refractory, uh, you know, concept that we can only consume so much protein, uh, you know, the, the magical number thrown around, 30 grams per meal, um, all of those sorts of things. So what is your take on uh, spreading the protein uh, per meal and how do we uh, distribute that daily intake? Ugh. Sorry to keep Sorry. you up, man bores me to tears not it's, it's actually uh it's the middle of the day in the states so there's nothing to worry about um what time is it in uh in oz Nine forty-two a.m oh that's a reasonable time this yeah. is like a like an intersection of both reasonable yeah, times it, it really is i was stoked when you said uh 5 p.m est <laughs> yeah for sure versus like 1 p.m you'd have to yeah. wake up balls early um okay so protein dosing the thing is, the amount of evidence on the leucine threshold and the refractory period is quite small. There's another problem with the refractory period. Almost all of that research is done with bouts of essential amino acids or whey protein. Here's the problem. When you eat a burrito, well, an omelet for breakfast with some or whole wheat uh, toast and some eggs and some cheese, and then you eat a burrito for lunch, and then you train later and you have a protein shake, with carbs and you go out for sushi after that and you come home and you have uh, you know two apples and a casing shake and go to bed there is due to the slow digestion speed of protein especially complicated with fats and fibers and carbs there's no time in which you're not getting a relatively steady stream of amino acids into the gi tract there's just no time and um certainly in the bloodstream so the refractory period seems to just completely disappear. The appearance of amino acids in your bloodstream with such a p method of eating, even four meals a day, with roughly mixed macros and even protein doses, uh, that kind of eating pattern gives you roughly the same curve of appearance of amino acids or presence of amino acids in the bloodstream that uh, an IV will. <laughs> so it's just pretty continuous. Mm. So when we say like there's got to be these boluses of protein, I mean, do we mean that we can't eat normal meals anymore and we have to like wake up, have a whey protein 60 gram shake and then not eat for a while and maybe eat some carbs and then not eat for a while and have another shake? Like that's insane. Nobody eats like that. And the thing is, most of the people that have been training for a long time and gaining very good muscle have relied on primarily whole food diets. Um, so I'm not – the refractory stuff on protein is interesting physiologically, but I'm not sure how much we can conclude from it. Um the leucine threshold is pretty easy to, to meet if you're eating normal food. Uh, so where does that leave us? Well, I think Brad Schoenfeld did a good job summarizing the literature, is that if you you can eat two to three meals a day and get pretty decent anti-catabolic effect, um, but you're not going to maximize anabolic effects until you get to four or five meals a day and more the merrier, but it doesn't really probably help. So I think if you have uh, at least four relatively evenly spread high protein meals, you're putting a 90% check mark there by protein feeding. If you have a meal, let, let's try to violate that. So if you eat protein twice a day, it's probably not optimal, even if the grams total are the same. Here's another way you could fuck that up. You could have breakfast and have 10 grams of protein. Lunch is another 10 grams. And then dinner and uh, supper each have to uh, 100 grams in them so you get 220 per day yeah you met you know gram per kilo or whatever uh or two grams per per kilo but where does that leave you <laughs> as far as you know what's the morning like i mean uh, from mid of middle of the night all the way through your dinner your total protein exposure was 20 grams i mean you're not, you're missing out on muscle growth and it might you might reanalyze enough to get rid of the muscle loss. You might not lose muscle with such a timing strategy, but it sure as hell won't be optimal, right? Um, so so basically, we, we get to the scenario where it's not just eating meals relatively evenly spaced. Each meal has to have a pretty good chunk, a relatively even split chunk of protein if you're spacing your meals evenly. Does that make sense? Definitely, definitely. And yep. in terms of peri workout nutrition. I think this is, again, uh, probably a topic in the evidence-based community that uh, has swung 
in the other direction. So the pendulum was in favor of uh, the anabolic window. If you didn't have your post-workout shake, you know, dude, you were doomed. I think who wrote the book Nutrient Timing back in like 2006? John Ivey. John Ivey, that's right. It was like 2006. I remember reading that and me and my brother literally did not miss. We would have our shake at the gym as we're walking out ritually because we were afraid of uh, losing our gains. We'd have like intra workouts, um, you know, pre-workouts, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of uh, the pendulum shifting, now people, uh, you know, have read literature uh, by Alan Aragon and Schoenfeld that's, you know, uh, hypothesized the, it's more of an anabolic barn door than a window and pretty much throw caution to the wind and say, fuck it, well, I don't need to have a, a post-workout meal. Um, you know, I can just eat within three hours or so, and that's probably fine. Um, but what are your thoughts? You know, if somebody's really looking to maximize their gains, uh, you know, how much attention should they pay to peri-workout nutrition? And if so, how do they do it? What's your advice? Yeah, so... You got to uh, fuck. It's boring to talk to you, man. It's killing me. <laughs> it's, it's my so, boring Australian accent. Nah, There's nothing boring about that. I assure you. Um, so here's the deal: your pre-workout nutrition, which could be a meal between one and three hours before your workout, on average, has to have a good enough protein level to make sure you stay anti-catabolic through the workout, and also just to you know, be anabolic for other muscles that have been trained. It's not just one workout. Um, and then your carbohydrates should be relatively decent in that meal. Uh, not so much that you can't stomach them and throw up, but enough to get you really good blood glucose levels and make sure that you're really, uh, you're a little top off your glycogen stores a little bit, so on and so forth to get you the best possible training result, have really good training energy. If a workout lasts significantly longer than an hour and is uh, causing you a lot of dehydration and is really, really hard, this is less, muscle growth and more performance nutrition. Um, a workout shake can be an okay idea, just a very small shake, a little bit of amino acids or car uh, protein and carbs, uh, very fast digesting, certainly not a requirement. And then post-workout, you know, post-workout, you get quite a bit of catabolism going on, and you probably want to mute that at least to some extent. And the level of anabolism from that workout doesn't start to rise until many hours later. But uh, the level of anabolism... Um, is probably at least somewhat triggered by the presence of amino acids. So we use the shake after a workout as a potentiator of future growth, not a literal supplier of current mm. growth. Um, is it a big deal? No. If you save that shake for later, it'll just potentiate more later. But you're missing a little bit of a sensitive window. So it's one of these things that'll make you know just a couple of percent difference. But I think it's worth after your workout. You know, within the next 15 to 30 minutes, probably a good idea to have some protein and carbohydrates. Great time to take in carbohydrates because you're more insulin sensitive, so on and so forth, which you potentially even more hypertrophy, reloads your muscle glycogen, yada, yada, yada. So all that stuff adds up to where you should be eating plenty of carbs before training, getting some carbs and protein in with low fats after training. Low fats mostly just to make sure that their carbs and proteins get there in a timely manner without being delayed a lot. There's some formative literature to say that post-workout fats and high-fat high fat diets in general are suppressive of muscle growth. Very interesting. A little bit in humans, a little bit in animals, but um, we'll see how that works out later. It would be very, very concordant with a decades-long practice in bodybuilding of not eating a high-fat diet. There's almost no bodybuilders that eat high-fat diets. It's very, very rare. Um, so... Uh, you know, taking all that together, you know, it is a bar door. It's not a window. So, yeah, first 45 minutes, you should get something in. But for the next, you know, six hours, you should be continuously eating a higher protein, higher carb uh, food intake in order to continue to sort of supply the beginnings of muscle growth that occur. And muscle growth occurs for hours and days later. So how you eat the next day is super important as well. Uh, and it's just consistent meal after meal spread by four to six hours. That's how you build muscle. Should you be attentive to your workout window to have good performance and good recovery? Yeah, sure. But it's not like this crazy make or break mm -hmm. window that people think it might be. Awesome. And, and you start to mention how, uh, you know, there's not a lot of bodybuilders who adopt a, a high fat diet and you very much, uh, in the natural bodybuilding community anyway, uh, over recent times popularized high carb, low fat, uh, dieting for, for muscle gain. Uh, and there's some, uh, potential, uh, I guess, theories and, and reasons, uh, for that, uh, rationale. So do you want to explain them? 
Yeah, so I, uh, sure, I, just to keep uh, terminological consistency with my earlier stuff, I would uh, call them hypotheses. They call the whole thing a hypothesis. Uh, you know, theories are very, very well supported. Uh, mm. Framework of interconnected facts. Is, you know, the, yeah, yeah. So, so definitely a hypothesis. Uh, so as not to lend me too much credit. Also, not lend me too much credit. I don't this value really, you whatsoever, Mike. The fuck are you talking about? I don't even know what your name is. What is your name? You look like a Frank or a John, something regular. <laughs> So, uh, the second thing, Oi, Cobra, fuck off. <laughs> so when aliens land in Australia, <laughs> it, 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 if they say nah, yeah, or yeah, nah, is one of those like totally wrong and gets them killed. And the other one's like, Oi, you want of us? Fuck it's off. Pretty much. We throw a boomerang at anyone who says nah, yeah. It's yeah, nah, so I can't. Yeah, nah. I probably should say that on the podcast. It's a self canceling self canceling statement. You say yes, you say no, welcome to Australia. Nothing makes any sense. <laughs> no visa for you. <laughs> for sure. So like the visa people for the conference we're putting on in uh, June are gonna see this video and they're like, There's no way we're letting this guy come through here. Um all right, so uh, the thing, second thing is, is the high carb, low fat mass wasn't so much my idea. It was inspired greatly and informed greatly by one of my coaches or my main coach um, for supplements. His name is Broderick Chavez, and he's a real super, super smart guy. Broderick um, is, uh, you know, to him, I remember uh, talking to him really early on, like two years ago, and uh, we were talking about theory and macros and stuff, and I'm like, well, you know, what about the benefits of eating more fats? And he's like, like, what benefits? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, fats are kind of just, if you compare them to carbs and proteins, they just don't do as much. So that's fine. They're fine to eat. But what you really mean is that within a caloric constraint, um, eating more fats means less carbs and proteins mm -hmm. by definition. Since you meet your proteins and those are fine, you really have a, uh, you know, and they're so important, we're not going to trade them off. We really have a carbs versus fats battle. So on the plus side, eating more carbs secretes more insulin, which is anti-catabolic, like crazy, and in 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 a little bit anabolic, even in uh, drug-free circumstances. Uh, loaded glycogen causes is more permissive and 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 signals muscle growth more. Um, higher blood glucose levels let you train super hard. Higher carbohydrate levels lead to better recovery and thus increase your maximum recoverable volume, which is really sweet. Um, and uh, higher carbohydrates reduce the amount of cortisol that you have, which is itself catabolic and causes more fatigue, so on and so forth. And all the way down the line, we have these multiple advantages of carbohydrates, uh, much of it through insulin action and some just through carbs alone. And then we get to the benefits of, you know, this is minimum fats have to be met for hormonal, so on and so forth. But then we get to the benefits of, of, of having a high fat diet. And it, God, geez, there's just not that many, you know, like, okay, what if I had like 100 grams? What if I have 150 grams of fat per day? It's like, I don't know, like testosterone can peak at a pretty high level of fat. But then again, it's been shown pretty clearly that serum testosterone levels with a natural range probably don't mean a fucking mm -hmm. thing. So that's out. As long as your testosterone is not low, you're doing great which it's not as long as you can consume something like 0.6 grams of fat per kilo per body weight per day and then the rest of this carbs. And then any other advantage of fats is really just cursory at best or so by no means clear. And the more fats you eat, the fewer carbs you eat and get rid of a lot of the really great advantages of high carbs. So that's kind of the interlaced hypothesis of like, look, if you have a choice and you've your sex drive is good, your hormones are good, and that level of fat that you're getting is good for that, Let's layer in more carbs to meet your calorie goals. Of course, protein stays constant, and maybe it'll do well with that. And almost everyone I've had try this approach has sung its praises. And really, that's how the majority of the bodybuilding community eats anyway. And this is something that's true for the non-drug-free and drug-free community. I mean, nobody's out there eating 50% of the calories from fat and uh, a few people are, but that's pretty aberrant. That's very unusual. So that's kind of the high carb massing. Um, is it fun? Yeah, for a while, but then it gets really tedious because there's only so much rice you're going to eat until you're like, mm -hmm. what the fuck? And you get cravings for like, I want peanut butter, I want cheese, but you can't have any of that stuff or not enough of it to really uh, quench you. So it's definitely a trade off, but especially if you're more advanced, it could definitely be worth it. it I'll tell you what it does do it for sure changes your training and your pumps in a way that is addictive. Like you start smashing 600 grams of carbs per day, not only are you gonna be pumped all the time, 
But when you get pumps like a chest and bicep pump, you're like, I swear to God, I'm going to fall out of my fucking body. Like it's unreal. And we know that pumps are actually literally anabolic. Uh, cell swelling is uh, hypertrophic. So that's a real good thing. Mm -hmm. Your recovery is going to be completely different. Like when I switched to higher carbon takes, I could just train more and recover that much faster. Like I trained, I got sore, but I healed faster. And I'm like, mm -hmm. huh, all right, I can live with that. You know, so it's one of those things where the high carb massing, I think is, it's a really small benefit. I think as long as you have a surplus and you eat plenty of carbs enough to do the job, you're going to do great. But the high carb massing might offer a couple of percentage point increase. And, and this thing, if you're advanced, a couple percentage points is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. In my experience, uh, you know, using the high carb, uh, th theory, it's, it's pretty insane. Like my, my quads, my, like everything after training just feels almost unbearably comfortable. And then it's like, it just, the pump hangs around longer. Yeah. It doesn't just yeah. dissipate in an hour and you feel like, fuck, it's gone. You know, and you just want to go back and hit the gym again. It's like, it literally hangs around. And, and I did notice quicker recovery as well. Um, yeah. so yeah, guys get on that high carb massing. And, and, and another thing I want to talk about, uh, before we move into, you know, some, some broader discussions about massing is that many people when they start a mass, uh, don't understand the role of fiber when you're eating a bucket load of carbohydrates and a calorie surplus. Um, you know, they'll just they'll eat more calories and they'll get it from pretty much anywhere and they'll keep a lot of their foods the same, you know, they'll eat their vegetables, they'll eat a lot of fruits and things like that because, you know, their carb sources, all the rest of it, uh, which is great in a fat loss phase um, because you find, and I've found this with a lot of my clients, uh, many of them will have dieted for fat loss intentionally, anyway, a much larger percentage of their training career than what they would have for muscle gain. So, so it's almost like they just don't understand some of these nuances when the energy balance flips. Um, but it's not... Fiber intake uh, can be a problem if we're massing. Um, so you spoke about this at the UEBC this year. Uh, we can manipulate a number of variables, uh, you know, to to account for uh, you know the hedonic power of food, and, and fiber was one of those when we're massing, uh, if memory serves. Um, so yeah, what's the approach for fiber and keeping that at bay? Totally. Well, so like you know, if you eat really good food sources, primarily veggies, uh, fruits, and whole grains. They're great for fat loss dieting because they keep you full. They give you lots of fiber. They have lots of micronutrients. And because when you're on a calorie deficit, you need your foods to be more nutritious per unit of food because otherwise you could uh, result in just not having enough daily nutrition for micros. When you start massing, that first – or the problem I just mentioned kind of goes away. You know, you, you have plenty of food coming in, so your nutrition is probably good. And then you have sort of potentially another uh, problem there. And the problem is that past a certain level of fiber intake, if you still continue to eat those super healthy foods, they come stocked with fiber. Past a certain intake, you're going to be uncomfortable in the bathroom. Basically, your shits are going to be massive um, and really frequent. And then eventually, if you eat more and more fiber, you can actually get pretty good GI distress. You fart all the time. Um, you shit super often. Um, and then, you know, you can get to a point where it's rare, but you can get a little bit deficient on some nutrients because your fiber is so high, it just flushes you right out. Um, so in, in, in before that, you'll get into a place where eating that much fibrous food is so difficult. You're so not hungry for it because you're so full all the fucking time that it's going to be almost impossible. People say there's no way I can eat this many carbs. Well, if you eat mo mostly in white rice, regular bread, and maybe threw in some mass gainer shakes like some glucose shakes, you could eat it no problem. Some skim milk, so on and so forth. And they're like, oh, I've never really thought of that. But what about fruits and veggies and stuff? You should still have some but reduce their amounts when you're massing if you need it. Like if you can eat completely super healthy foods, veggies, fruits, whole grains, and still put on weight, still get in the carbs, great, do it. But as soon as you start experiencing these symptoms of not enough hunger, too much GI distress, uh, shit that sends you to the moon, then you can consider reducing your fiber to make it seem uh, you know, better. Awesome, awesome. And I think that's laid the foundations of you know uh, what what people need to do with their their diet for the most part, um, but in terms of how you know individuals listening, uh, their clients uh, should be tracking uh, their body weight and calories. Um, you know, I guess a massing phase for many is going to be the off season, um, or at least you know uh, precede 
subsequent dieting phases. And I think, you know, when you have more food, you've obviously got a little bit more flexibility. You can enjoy life a little bit more. Um, and it can be mentally refreshing to put away my fitness pal and not neurotically, you know, weigh measure food to the gram, uh, you know, during a massing phase. Um, especially if you're going to be dieting later on, it can be exhausting if you're, you know, 365 days a year, you know, uh, neurotically tracking for many anyway. Uh, so I guess in a massing phase, how much lenience do people have with, you know, tracking calories? Do they need to be, uh, you know, really focused on the numbers or are they, you know, can they just measure their body weights, you know, tick the protein box and, and make sure they're doing those things? Or do you recommend, you know, focusing a little bit more on, uh, you know, controlling the variables to get the most out of it? Depends on your situation, but I would say that some situations the tracking is definitely more beneficial and some it's not nearly as much. When you're just coming off of a contest prep or a really harsh diet, if you go the intuitive route, you're just going to get to be a fat piece of shit because you're going to overeat like crazy. So I would say after a contest, I think you should track exactly as meticulously mm-hmm. did pre-contest. And with tracking, slowly increase your carb and fat intakes to where a month or two later, you're not super hungry anymore. You're getting lots of food. Everything's going well. What you can do then is still track most of your food, but on weekends and stuff, just try to keep it clean. Don't go nuts. Keep the fat level in check. Because Did you that's just say keep it to, clean, man? <laughs> yeah, you got to like uh, put detergent on your food to clean it we call it ajax um, in australia it's called ajax spray and wipe perfect you can just you anything can ajax and clean that's it so um what you can do is just keep it you know not too junky and uh limit the fats make sure that just you know you're not eating you know, entire jars of nut butter um which by the way I, I, it's funny Someone told me once uh, before I went to Australia, they're like, oh, yeah, like we do peanut butter. They do Vegemite. And then I got there and I was like, who eats Vegemite? And everyone's like, nobody eats fucking Vegemite. What the hell's wrong with you? And then I was like, how much do you put on your bread? And they're like, like a tenth of a fucking teaspoon. Yeah. Are you nuts? That shit's potent. Like, it is potent. It's not. It's like the yeah. saltiest thing anyone's ever made. So it's good I don't even know why it has. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> to get you fucking nuts. Yeah. Um, I don't know why it, it's called, they got veg at anything in the name. What, vegetable is not tar? as tar a vegetable? It's like tar, yeah. yeah. My kids have it, actually. They love it. Really? Yeah. It's How strange. do they eat it? On toast or like, we call them biscuits, but they're like crackers. So you put a bit uh-huh. of butter. So you got to have it with butter. That's the key. If you have Vegemite on its own, like out of the jar, it's like it's not like peanut butter where you can just scoop it out and eat it. That's disgusting. Right. It literally okay. has to be, like like you said, one-tenth on butter, buttered bread. And it's like, it's got a really nice, like, sort of finishing touch to to the toast and stuff. I actually don't mind it, but if you just have huge chunks of it, yeah, it can make you want to spew. Yeah, there you go. Don't eat Vegemite on the mass. It, it won't, uh, <laughs> you know, increase the palatability of your food. <laughs> Yeah, the road to nowhere. (laughs) So um, basically, you want to sort of keep it easy on the weekends, but maybe on weekends or evenings here and there, you can just eat well and maybe even have a couple cheat meals, but don't go nuts. And you'll notice that your body weight is responding exactly how you thought. You're gaining a weight at a good pace all as well. And then as you continue to do that, you know, as you gain longer and longer, maybe mini cut, maybe maintain and gain again, as you get heavier and heavier and outside of your normal range of weights – you're not going to have to keep tracking to make sure you don't Mm -hmm. overeat. Uh, You might track to make sure you don't undereat, but before you get to that level, and a lot of people never will, you can get get your protein in, um, get your fats to the minimums at least, and then just smash carbs throughout the day with your meals, make sure they're tasty, get a good amount in, and use your hunger to regulate. So basically, like if you're nice and stuffed most of the day, you're doing a great job. Mm-hmm. Or if you happen to gain easy, you're nice and full, you do a great job. Um, I will say this. The best possible way to get away from tracking is to get a consistency of eating going. If you have similar things for breakfast, similar things for lunch, you pack your own lunch, you eat most of your dinners at home, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be super easy to just not track because you know you're getting good food. You know the amounts are good. And then you go from there and you're flexible. Mm-hmm. It, where tracking really comes in super handy, or rather, it's best to say where tracking is not easily and not as easily replaceable, is when you're always on the go eating, always eating different shit. You just don't have any idea how much of anything you're eating, and then all of a sudden that really sucks, right? Because you're you're kind of in a position where 
you know, you're just, it's just not clear at all that you're eating enough and you can go a week and two weeks and under eat and lose weight and you're like, God damn it. I knew I should have tracked, right. Or get away from yourself and go super ham. I, it's one of those interesting things why sort of the, my fitness pal generation, uh, that my fitness pal is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because you can find macros on anything and type them in. One of the ways in which it's maybe not a bad thing, but one of the downsides is people never ever develop dietary habits Mm, and they never get away from tracking. They just do this smorgasbord splotch of (laughs) you basically playing like you're pacing, you're playing Tetris with macros, Mm, right? You're like, what can I fit in? And then like, you just had like one slice of pizza for breakfast that you had a protein shake for lunch. And then you had one stock of broccoli for (laughs) evening snack. And then you (laughs) go to karaoke and sushi and you have 10 pounds of sushi and you're like, I did it. I met my macros. And it's like, this is not, I mean, you did, you got your macros, you got your calories. And the little music on on my fitness pal plays. It's like you level up and all the music. That's it. And then the the macros come in faster the next day or something. (laughs) That'd be hilarious. Like you got to eat meals. No, 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 no. You're like, oh my God, I can't find my macros. (laughs) You, like there should be a my fitness pal competition where it's like the quicker you can find like reference foods like okay you're at mecca's and you've got to eat a cheeseburger go you're like found it got it registered like oh but it's with fries like shit 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 and fries it's like those so, um those little asian kids who do the rubik's cube it's just like just it's just so fast it makes you feel like you're not human or they're yeah. not human right like yeah. so uh so basically um it's one of those things where tracking is all good and well but a good, consistent eating patterns make make tracking less of a priority. But I will say this: short of consistent eating patterns, listening really well to your well-established and understood hunger cues, and having good habits for eating or tracking, you can't get away from both of those for very long. I think like you take a week in in Bali and you eat fuck all, and who cares? Just get protein in. I think you're totally cool. But as a sustainable mass gaining, muscle gaining strategy. You gotta either have habits or track. You can do both, but one or the other is totally cool, but you can't do neither. You know, some people are like, I hate tracking. And they're like, okay, so just have consistent meals that you eat, you know what's in them, you don't have to worry. Like, I hate eating consistently. It's like, okay. I don't know what to tell you. You're not gonna get jacked. (laughs) Yeah, I think you brought up so many good points there. And I definitely agree in my own experience with, with a lot of my clients that people, who gravitate towards my fitness pal do so uh, because they're busy. Their you know lifestyle changes a lot. Uh, they don't have access to the same uh, foods on a regular basis, and it, and it works well. Um, but I think you know if you can get away from my fitness pal and establish good habits, and like you said, modulate your intake based on uh, hunger and fullness cues, uh, as well as you know scale weight using using those uh, you know as proxies for increasing intake and stuff that's uh, a lot more sustainable approach anyway and i think uh it frees up a lot of uh, mental and cognitive energy to go towards other things so perfect totally. mike. well mike thank you very much for coming on uh, guys be sure to follow mike if you don't already he posts a lot of photos of his food uh, on social media which i'm sure you guys will uh, enjoy be sure to ask him how many calories he eats he really loves that question um, and check out RP, so Renaissance Periodization, uh, their app. Make sure you check out RP Plus, fantastic resource online for, for coaches and individuals who want to learn more about lifting and, and science and things. And yeah, Mike will be down 2019 in June for the Ultimate Evidence Based Conference, and we're looking forward to seeing him then. And the final question, Mike, this is probably the most serious question is what color fanny pack and Crocs are you going to be wearing next year? So, can I get you a, a, a usually, pair of Crocs that mm-hmm. have the Australian flag across them? Yes. Are you kidding that. me? I would wear those in a heartbeat. <laughs> um, I would wear that as my regular shoe. So, short of the Australian flag Crocs, I'll be wearing my the classic jet black tire rubber Crocs. <laughs> and they just cut them out of a tire somewhere in Thailand, I'm pretty sure. And then um, I will be almost certainly wearing uh, uh, the dark gray fanny pack. It's new. My buddy Charlie got me one. He got one himself. It's bigger so you can put more shit in it because I have like a wallet. I have keys. I have a glasses case, passport for when I travel abroad. It's just a lot of shit, you know, and I don't I hate having a stuffed fanny pack. So uh, bum bag, as you cunts call them over there. Right? So um, that's uh, what I'm going to be doing. And it's the fucking that's the way I'm going. <laughs> 
Like, we can't wait and look forward to it. Thank you very much for your time today. Guys, be sure to uh, check out Mike, RP, and all the work that they do. Thanks for listening.